out this evening. And we're very honored to have tonight as our guest speaker, Dr. Philip Payne. I wanted to just say a few words before, of course, Dr. Netland introduces Dr. Payne. And on behalf of the Graduate Student Government Association and the Trinity Society of Women in Trinity, we welcome you all today. We realize that this topic for many has become divisive. There have been very many interesting conversations that I've been having on the campus since we had this. Thankfully, most of them have been very open, very warm, very welcoming, and that is the reason that we're having these conversations here at Trinity, is because the church is not supposed to be divided. One of my favorite stories just from last week was one of our students who's in the, the uh, Master of Divinity program, who's in a church that has three elders, and one is egalitarian, one is soft complementarian, and the other is hard complementarian, and yet they all get along, they talk, they come to agreements and decisions together, and isn't this what the church is supposed to be about? So our encouragement is we realize there's a variety of views, as there should be. I was reminded recently as I was reading through Acts and Acts 15 how the apostles had great dis dissension amongst themselves. They greatly disagreed on certain topics, how to treat the Gentiles, how to treat the law, and so forth. But what they did, instead of saying, well, we're never talking to you again, because I also received a, some communication from another person who had been in a church that had split over the issue of the role of women and the people had never spoken to each other again. And as we know, this should not be so. So we encourage in all matters to, for us who uphold the word of God as precious and as God's word to be able to continue our conversations with each other. And as Ephesians says, to walk worthy of the calling with which we've been called with all humility, gentleness, patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I'd like to welcome you here tonight as well. And uh, it's really a special I've been losing my voice for a week now, and I was hoping it would last through this evening. We'll find out if it does or not. But uh, it's a special privilege for me to welcome Phil Payne back to campus here. Uh, Phil is no stranger to Trinity. Uh, he's a graduate of Trinity, uh, and then he taught here back in the 1970s. And if our math is correct, it's been 30 plus years since Phil was last year, so it's good to have him back. Now, I'd like to share just a little bit on the personal side. You can see his credentials. Uh, he's a fine New Testament scholar, PhD from Cambridge. He's taught at a number of uh, institutions, published widely in uh, New Testament studies and so on. Uh, I had the privilege of getting to know Phil back around 1980. I know, I know, I was just a kid at that time, but uh, I was in my doctoral studies. And uh, the Lord brought Phil and Nancy Payne into my life at a very uh, pivotal time. And it was through Phil and Nancy Payne that uh, my wife and I ended up going to Japan with the Free Church as missionaries. And uh, Phil and Nancy had been uh, missionaries in Japan. Now Phil had uh, completed his studies at Cambridge in record time, uh, really distinguished himself. Uh, frankly, he could have been teaching at any seminary here in the States that he wanted to. Uh, he felt the Lord calling him into mission service in Japan. And so Phil and Nancy went to Japan as career missionaries uh, with the Free Church, working with university students and uh, doing teaching and lecturing in uh, seminaries and theological colleges. Uh, Ruth and I were supposed to join them in a, a ministry among university students in Kyoto. And uh, we were looking forward to that very much. Uh, one of the mysteries of God's providence in leading, uh, Phil and Nancy had to return to the States for medical reasons. And after teaching at Gordon-Conwell and Bethel, uh, they ended up uh, relocating in Seattle, where he was the uh, founding president of Linguist Software. So we never were able to work together in Japan, but uh, they have been wonderful friends through the years. And uh, I've learned so much from Phil. I can remember back in 1980, 81, 
Phil would talk me through the arguments and the issues which now are published in book form uh, low 30 years later. So he's been working on these issues for many, many years. Uh, he was widely respected, highly appreciated in Japan. Uh, one of the things that I appreciated about Phil so much was his uh, deep, consistent commitment to the full authority of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture. And he gave lectures in Japan on the subject at a time when this was extremely uh, divisive, volatile, and important. And uh, this is also how he has approached the whole issue of uh, women in ministry and how what Scripture has to say about this. He comes to his position not in spite of his commitment to inerrancy, but because of it. And I think this is one of the distinctives of uh, Phil's position here. So I will be quiet now after I open with a short word of prayer, and then Phil will invite you to come and speak uh, to us. But let's go to the evening to the Lord. Father, what a privilege it is indeed to uh, welcome Phil back to Trinity after these many years. We thank you for his life, for Nancy's life, for their uh, commitment to you individually and collectively as a family. Uh, thank you for the many gifts that you have given to Phil and the way that uh, he has used them uh, for your glory and the furtherance of the church and for what he has meant uh, to the Japanese church over the years as well. Father, we pray that your spirit would be with us this evening, uh, guiding us and helping us to uh, work through some contentious and sometimes divisive issues in a way that honors you and brings glory to your name. Thank you again for this privilege we have to listen to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. I hope you appreciate it. I think we're going to go with this one. Uh, can you hear okay? Everyone can, good. I hope you appreciate what a treasure you have in Harold Network. He is an amazing person, uh, not just gifted intellectually, but the way he's able to relate across the aisle with scholars of very different perspectives. Uh, he's a gem, and I'm so grateful for him. Does it really matter? what the Bible says about man and woman. You bet it does. Jesus repeatedly affirmed the authority of Scripture. Paul said that God's Word is inspired. It's God-breathed. This is perfectly holy Word and our final authority in all matters, including man and woman. So, when some argue that the Bible opposes the equal standing of man and woman, in the church and the home, they are taking the issue to the final court of appeals as they should. Twelve seemingly strong biblical reasons support their argument. One, male headship. Two, wives submit to your husbands. Three, women may not teach. Four, man's priority in the creation order. Five, woman is man's helper. Six, God decreed, he will rule over you. Seven, in the Old Testament, only males exemplify leadership. Eight, only males were priests. Nine, only males were apostles. Ten, only males were overseers, pastors, or elders. Eleven, Women should not speak in church. And 12, men and women have separate roles in the church. Does this not mean that the Bible and therefore God is overwhelmingly in favor of male hierarchy? I first heard the claim that the Bible does not limit the ministry of women as a beginning PhD student at Cambridge. I almost stood up in the middle of the lecture and said, that's not true. But I determined to prove it was false. This talk distills over 39 years of research about these 12 reasons. It highlights a small selection of the crucial evidence that the biblical passages to which they appeal 
do not warrant the complementarian view that women should not have authority over men in the church and in the home. I discovered that many of the very scriptures I thought supported complementarian thought actually promote the equal standing of men and women in the church and in the home. But before we go into these, I want to give you some basic principles that form my thought. First is, the Bible is God's inerrant word in the original autographs. This means that the search for the original form of scripture, the original text, is important, is crucial. And number two, our authority is the original text properly understood as it was intended by the author. The Bereans search the scriptures to see if these things were so. That takes work. It takes work to find the original intent because we're 2,000 years after that. Third principle, some scriptures are more important than others. Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, you tie a dill mitt and cumin, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law. We need in all of our discussions regarding this to exemplify the things that all we accept are crucial to the faith, love, grace, peace, truth. Fourth principle, you interpret the hard to understand passages in light of the easier to understand passages. Complementarians agree with all four of these positions, in theory. However, many complementarians when asked, what does the Bible really teach about man and woman, say something like, just go read the Bible. It's obvious. But, principle one is, we, it's based on the original text of scripture. It's the autographs that have the authority. And yet, when I do research about the autographs, many complementarians act as though I'm a heretic for raising the question of what was the original text. Number two, what was the author's intent? This takes work. You can't simply assume that the English connotations for the word head were the same connotations that the Greeks used. The fourth principle, interpret passages that are hard to understand in light of the clear, would urge us to begin with those passages whose wording, whose syntax, whose message is abundantly clear, rather than on the most difficult passages. And yet, most complementarians use as a filter through which they interpret every other passage about men and women, 1 uh, Timothy 2.12. And yet the key word in that passage and the key idea in complementary thought is the authority of the man or the woman. And yet the New Testament word always used for authority does not occur here. In fact, the word that occurs here occurs only once in the Bible. And the first clear instance where it means to exercise authority is 300 years after Paul. And yet they interpret everything based on the assumption that this word means to exercise authority. That's not the way it's supposed to be. You start with the clear, and you move out. Well, let's begin with these 12 points. Reason number one, the Bible teaches male headship. Male headship means that only males should be leaders in the church and the home. It's based on statements in the Bible that man is the head of woman, and the husband is the head of his wife. These English translations seem to imply head as authority over 
But their current texts explain that they mean, respectively, the man Adam is the source of woman, and a husband is a source of love and nourishment for his wife. In Paul's day, the Greek word for head, kephale, was not commonly associated with leadership like it is in English. The most exhaustive Greek dictionary lists 48 translations of kephale, but none mean leader or authority or anything similar. Nearly all dictionaries covering native Greek usage up to New Testament times do not give even one example of kephale that means authority. Source, however, is a standard meaning of kephale. The point of Paul's head-body metaphors with Christ as the head of his body, the church, is not that Christ is the authority of the church. Well, of course, he is the authority of the church. The point Paul is making is that Christ is the source of life and nourishment for the church. For instance, Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body of the church who is the arche, the origin, the source of the body's life. Colossians 2.19, the kephale, from whom the whole body grows. Ephesians 4, 15 to 16, the head that is Christ, from whom the whole body grows. The Greek Old Testament shows that most of its translators did not regard kephale as an appropriate word to convey leader. When referring to a physical head, they almost always chose kephale, but they hardly ever chose it when the Hebrew word for head meant leader. In 171 such instances, the standard Greek translation of the Old Testament translates kephale, clearly meaning kephale, only six times. And several of those may be a simile, in which case it's used as a head. I have not found a single instance where Paul clearly teaches male headship. But he clearly teaches again and again leadership in the church and in the home by women. He repeatedly affirms women in his list of church leaders. Seven of the ten people Paul names as colleagues of ministry in Romans 16 are women. Phoebe, deacon of the church of Kenkria, and leader of many, including myself. Junia, outstanding among the apostles. Prisca, my fellow worker in Christ Jesus, and Mary, Tryphena, Tryphosa, Persis, worked hard in the Lord. Paul lists many names, but he affirms only a few as working hard in gospel ministry. And most of them are women. He names the wives of Aquila and Andronicus two of the three men identified in ministry in the same list highlighting their sheer authority. I know of no parallel to Paul's naming so many women leaders in an open society in the entire history of Greek literature. In spite of his male-centered culture, Paul repeatedly affirms women in church leadership. Reason number two. Ephesians 5 teaches Wives, submit to your husbands. Grammatically, the wife's submission is explicitly one facet of mutual submission. It refers to voluntary yielding in love. Paul calls both wives and husbands to defer to and nurture one another. Christ is the model for all believers, even as head, which 4.16 explains as the source of the body's growth. Paul defines what he means by head in Ephesians 5.23, similarly by equating it with Savior through emphatic apposition. Christ, 
head of the church, he Savior of the body. What does Christ do as Savior? Paul explains. He gives himself for the church and nourishes and cherishes it. Paul also treats husbands and wives equally in relation to their children and tells wives to rule their homes, literally, be house despots. If this is a leadership in the home, what is? Paul's most detailed treatment of marriage, 1 Corinthians 7, identifies exactly the same conditions, opportunities, rights and responsibilities for wives and husbands regarding 12 different issues about marriage, both natural and spiritual. In each, he addresses men and women as equals. His wording is symmetrically balanced to reinforce their equality. Paul affirms that husband and wife mutually possess each other. They have mutual conjugal rights, authority over the other's body, and sexual obligations. He tells both not to divorce. Both, are, both set apart the other and their children with special privilege of experiencing the gospel lived out. Both have the freedom to remarry if deserted. Both have a potentially saving influence on the other. Paul even writes, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but his wife does. Richard Hayes correctly observes how revolutionary this was. Paul offers a paradigm-shattering shattering vision of marriage as a relationship in which partners are bonded together in submission to one another. Reason number three. 1 Timothy 2.12 prohibits women from teaching or having authority over men. A careful analysis of the vocabulary and syntax of 1 Timothy 2.12 shows that this verse simply prohibits women in first century Ephesus from seizing authority to teach men. It does not prohibit women from teaching men as long as they have recognized teaching authority, like Priscilla did. The old NIV misleadingly reads, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. This translation is doubtful for four reasons. First, the key Greek verb here, authentic, is best translated to assume authority. The first documented occurrence of authentic clearly meaning exercise authority is three centuries after Paul wrote. Every other reference to authority in the New Testament is based on a different word, exousia. In Paul's, in Paul's day, authentic could mean either to dominate or more commonly, to assume authority. Every time, it means assume authority. The authority is seized, not rightfully held. The King James translation to usurp authority reflects this understanding. The standard New Testament Greek dictionary defines it to assume a stance of independent authority. The NIV 2011 correctly translates it to assume authority. Second, Paul typically uses the conjunction in this verse, udea, to join two elements to convey a single idea. In this case, udea joins to teach and to assume authority. Consequently, Paul does not prohibit two things, teaching or seizing authority over men. He prohibits one thing, seizing authority to teach men. Similarly, Paul prohibited false teachers from unauthorized teaching in chapter 1. Third, the translation, I do not permit, is doubtful 
because the verb Paul chose normally refers to something limited in time, not permanent. Furthermore, its grammatical form is rarely used for a permanent prohibition, but usually focuses on a presently ongoing permission or prohibition. So it's best translated, I am not permitted. Fourth, if this verse is a permanent prohibition of women teaching or having authority over men, it contradicts the Bible's affirmations of women teaching. Acts 18.26 states that Priscilla and Aquila explained to Apollos, the eloquent male preacher, the way of God more accurately. She did this in the very city to which this prohibition is addressed. And probably was there when Paul wrote 1 Timothy, because she's greeted in 2 Timothy. Phoebe must also have taught adult men, since she delivered Paul's epistle to the Romans as Paul's emissary, and so naturally answered the Romans' questions about the letter. Acts 21 says, Philip had four daughters who prophesied. Elsewhere, Paul encouraged women to teach a church. 1 Corinthians 11.5 gives rules for every woman who prays or prophesies. 1 Corinthians 14.5 states, I would that every one of you prophesy. Verse 24 states, everyone is prophesying. Verse 26 states, whenever you come together, each one of you, which includes women as well as men, has a teaching. Did I can? Verse 31 affirms, you can all prophesy so that everyone may be instructed. Verse 39 commands, brothers and sisters be eager to prophesy. Likewise, Colossians 3.16 encourages all believers, teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. 1 Timothy 3, 1-2 states, whoever aspires to the office of overseer is able to teach. Paul commands older women in Titus 2, 3 to be teachers of what is excellent. Paul's guide for Christian discipleship states, entrust to reliable people who will be able to teach others with no hint that women are excluded. Demonstrating that the discipleship principle applies to women, Paul writes that Lois and Eunice taught Timothy with no hint that this teaching ever ended. He affirms, quote, your faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. They were teaching Holy Scripture. Hebrew states, brothers and sisters, by this time you ought to be teachers. God even revealed key passages of scripture through women. The first human prophecy in the New Testament was when Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed in a loud voice, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, the mother of my Lord. The second New Testament prophecy is Mary's Magnificent, which was also the first Christian exposition of Scripture. Every revelation in Scripture through women teaches divine truth. These passages and other references to women teaching demonstrate the error of interpreting 1 Timothy 2.12 as a permanent prohibition against women teaching. The fourth reason, the creation order establishes man's priority over woman. Nothing in Genesis teaches that, cre that creation order establishes man's priority over woman. God created the plants and animals before man, yet to whom did God give dominion? 
Was it not the one formed later? In fact, the leadership of the one born later is a major Old Testament theme. Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, Judah over his older brothers, Moses over Aaron, David over his brothers, and so on. The Genesis account of creation teaches not hierarchy, but that both man and woman together have dominion over the earth. God created men and women equally in his image. This equality is not limited to spiritual standing before God, but includes shared authority over the earth. Contrary to the male-oriented customs of Paul's day, Genesis 2.24 calls the man, not his wife, to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. The Christian account does not grant man priority and status or authority over woman, but throughout emphasizes their equality. Reason number five. God calls woman man's helper in Genesis 2.18, so women must be subordinate to men. Wait a minute. The narrative structure of Genesis 2 climaxes in the creation of woman, highlighting man's need for a partner corresponding to him. God says, I will make a strength corresponding to him. In Genesis 2.18, the first word of this expression, sometimes translated helper, means strength, help, savior, or rescuer. Sixteen times it describes God as the helper, the rescuer of his people in need, their strength or power. The remaining three describe a military protector. It never implies subordination or submission to the one rescued. It means literally a strength as in front of him, namely a strength corresponding to him. Reason number six. Man ought to rule over woman. Since God decreed, he will rule over you. In Genesis 3.16. This is God's statement of what will result from the fall, not God's decree of what should be. Like every other result of the fall, this is something new, not in the original creation. It is a distortion of God's design. Even leading complementarians agree this is not a prescription of what should be. They fail to recognize and acknowledge, however, that the word for rule used here does not imply bad rule. Both major Hebrew lexicons identify every instance of this word in the Old Testament and list no negative meaning for it. This word is even used for God's rule. Since man's ruling over woman, even good rule, is a result of the fall, man must not have ruled over woman before the fall. Furthermore, Christ, the promised seed of the woman, has overcome the fall. New creatures freed by Christ should not foster any of the tragic consequences the fall introduced, including man's pattern of ruling over women. Reason seven. The Old Testament pattern of male leadership shows that God approves only male leaders. To claim that God approves only male leaders in the Old Testament is simply false. Even after the fall, the Old Testament describes many women in leadership with God's blessing. It never states that being female should disqualify them. The prophetess Miriam 
is sent by God to lead Israel. Micah 6.4. Deborah is one of the judges whom the Lord raised up and who saved Israel from the hands of their enemies. She was a prophetess and the highest leader in all Israel in her day. She, a wife and mother, has authority to command Israel's military leader, Barak, go, and he went. They worked together well with shared authority. He as military commander, she as commander in chief. Queen Esther has sufficient influence to save her people from imminent genocide and to bring about the destruction of the house of Haman along with 75,000 enemies of the Jews. She, along with Mordecai, wrote with full authority. And Esther's decree confirmed these regulations. The Bible praises the Queen of Sheba and the Queen of Chaldea. Although Queens Jezebel and Athaliah were wicked, like most of Israel's kings, the Bible does not criticize them or any other woman on the grounds that women should not have authority over men. Priests consulted the prophetess Holden on finding the lost book of the law. Men in spiritual leadership over Israel sought instruction from her. The king, the elders, the prophets, and the people accepted her word as divinely revealed. Their obedience to her sparked what is probably the greatest revival in all the history of Israel. More generally, the Old Testament expresses hope that all people, men and women, should take spiritual leadership as prophets. Moses said, would that all the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would put his spirit on them. Numbers 11.29. Joel predicted a greater prophetic role for women. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, even on my servants, both men and women. I will pour out my spirit in those days. And this was fulfilled at Pentecost. Never does the Bible state that women leaders are an exception to a scriptural principle. Quite the opposite of excluding women from leadership over men, the Old Testament describes God appointing women to both secular and sacred leadership. Reason number eight. In the Old Testament, God approves only male priests. The only significant social or religious position in the Old Testament where women are not described as holding that position is that of priest. The most obvious reason for this is the association of priestesses in pagan religions with prostitution, which Deuteronomy 23 prohibits. God repeatedly forbade Israel from giving an appearance of following the immoral practices of the surrounding nations. Yet, God commanded Moses to call all the children of Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, Exodus 19.6. Isaiah 61.6 predicts a future when all God's people will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. Reason nine, there were no women apostles, so there should be no women in church leadership. The assumption that a lack of women apostles excludes women from church leadership is a non sequitur. It's equally true that Jesus didn't appoint any Gentile or slave as a member of the Twelve. Does that mean that these should be excluded? from church leadership? Jesus' appointment of the 12, Jewish men, paralleled the 12 sons of Israel and reinforced the symbolism of the church as the new Israel. It was not aimed against women in church leadership. 
Jesus must not have wanted only male disciples because he encouraged women as disciples. When Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening, the posture and position of a disciple, Jesus affirms her. Mary has chosen the better part and it will not be taken away from her. Furthermore, Jesus did not limit the proclamation of the gospel to men. Mary Magdalene was the first person the resurrected Christ sought out and commissioned to announce the gospel of his resurrection and coming ascension. Christ appointed her an apostle to the apostles. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that what he had said to her about these things. Furthermore, Paul identifies Junia as outstanding among the apostles. Romans 16, 7. This group of apostles included James and Paul, who were both more influential than any of the twelve. Jesus' choice of the twelve in no way excludes women from leadership in the church. Reason number 10. Women must not be elders, overseers, or pastors of local churches because the Bible only identifies men, never women in these offices. This entire assertion is logically vacuous. Apart from Christ, the New Testament does not name anyone, man or woman, as an overseer or a pastor. The Bible does give John and Peter special titles containing the word elder, but they refer to their special status as apostolic high witnesses. They do not identify them as having a local church office. The only New Testament person named with the explicit title of a local church is Phoebe, deacon of the Church of Kinkery. The same title was used for pagan religious office and could apply to women. This is not the Greek word for deaconess, diakonism, and in context certainly does not mean maid. Cranfield argues it's virtually certain that Phoebe is being described as a or possibly the deacon of the Church of Cambria. John Calvin says she had a public office in the church. It makes no sense to exclude women from local church offices like pastor just because a woman was not given that title in the New Testament. After all, the only person named in the New Testament with an explicit title of church leadership was Phoebe, a woman. Paul encourages all believers to desire the office of overseer, stating, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. The subject of both Paul's lists of qualifications for overseers and elders in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 is anyone there is not a single masculine pronoun or any other limitation to men in either list, contrary to most English translations. Both the Common English Bible and the Contemporary English Version translate these passages faithfully without introducing any masculine pronouns. Some think that one woman man in 1 Timothy 3, 2, and 12 and Titus 1, 6 excludes women. But even prominent complementarians Doug Moo and Thomas Schreiner acknowledge this phrase does not exclude women. It is a requirement that overseers be monogamous, whether men or women. As Judenberger has shown, and Jesus' interpretation of Deuteronomy 24 and Mark 10, 12 confirms, it is common throughout the Bible for prohibitions addressing men only 
also to apply to women. For example, do not covet your neighbor's wife. It implicitly also prohibits coveting your neighbor's husband. Paul's point is not that all overseers must be married. Paul, after all, encourages single believers not to marry, but to be devoted to the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 7, furthermore, to demand that overseers be married would, I believe, exclude Jesus and virtually every Catholic priest, as well as monastics, men and women, and even Paul himself, from being an overseer. Since one woman man is an idiomatic phrase for a monogamous relationship, any claim that a single word from it, man, also functions separately as a universal requirement, must posit a double meaning. The context does not warrant this. It's bad hermeneutics to isolate a single word man from an idiomatic phrase, one woman man, and elevate that single word to the status of a separate universal requirement. It's like taking household out of ruling children and their own households well and insisting that only slave owners can be overseers. Furthermore, since Phoebe was a deacon and the qualifications for women are included under deacons right here in 1 Timothy 3, one woman man in the very next verse about deacons must not exclude women. <coughs> Consequently, this idiomatic phrase must not exclude women in the previous paragraph or in Titus 1. Reason number 11. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, commands three times let women be silent in the churches. It is true that these verses three times explicitly prohibit women from speaking in church. They even prohibit a respected woman, a wife, from asking questions in church out of a desire to learn. These verses have puzzled virtually everyone who studied them, including early church fathers, because their plain meaning contradicts statements throughout this chapter that all may teach and prophesy, and the affirmation of women prophesying in chapter 11. In addition, everywhere else Paul cites the law, he quotes scripture, but the law, in verse 34, never commands women to be in submission or to be silent in religious gatherings. In fact, Psalm 68, 11 states, the Lord announced the word, the women proclaiming it are a great company. Isaiah 49, 40 verse nine states, O woman, say, here is your God. Scholars who assume Paul is expressing a command in these verses have proposed an enormous number of interpretations to limit its demand for silence to something such as judging prophecies or only disruptive ch chatter, each contrary to its plain meaning in Greek and most English translations. These narrow interpretations do not fit the broad scope of this passage's unqualified demands for silence repeated three times for maximum emphasis. These interpretations permit the type of speech specifically prohibited in verse 35. The key to understanding these verses is evident in the earliest manuscripts of them. The fundamental question in determining the original text of scripture 
is known as Bengel's first principle. It states, the text that best explains the emergence of all other texts is most likely original. These verses follow verse 40 in Western text type manuscripts, but in other manuscripts, they follow verse 33. There are only three reasonable possibilities for their original location. After verse 33, after verse 40, or in the margin. Did New Testament scribes in copying manuscripts move large blocks of text this far without an obvious reason? No, they did not. In fact, there is not a single manuscript of any passage of comparable length in any of Paul's letters that has been moved this far without an obvious reason. It would have been totally out of character and convention for a scribe to move these verses from after verse 33 to after verse 40 or vice versa. It was scribal custom, however, to write omitted text in the margin and for scribes to copy text they found in the margin into the text where they thought they fit best. Similarly, any secretary to retyping an edited letter will move marginal notes into the body of the letter. Transcriptional probability, therefore, argues that someone first wrote verses 34 to 5 in the margin of a manuscript and later copies inserted it either after verse 33 or after verse 40. After all, common sense demands that something customary is more likely to occur than something so extraordinary that no other instance is known. As marginal text, its meaning is not constrained by the context. Consequently, its purpose is harder to determine. Specifically, we cannot know if this text in the margin was, is something Paul affirms or denies. Perhaps it identifies the false prophecy Paul had in mind in, in his adjacent reference to one who thinks he is a prophet. Let him know that what I write to you is the Lord's command. It's doubtful Paul himself penned these verses since the typical margin would not have room for this much text in his large handwriting, Galatians 3.11. Galatians 6.11. One can only conjecture who wrote it in the margin, why, and when. Therefore, this command that women be silent in the church should not be used to establish theology or church practice. Now, some may become alarmed that acknowledging this was probably added in the margin might undermine the reliability of other passages. However, this concern is unfounded. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 5 is a unique case. The only passage in Paul's letters where such a large block of text has been moved so far without an obvious reason. Its origin as marginal text is the only natural explanation of the manuscript evidence. Consequently, this key reason to regard it as marginal text does not support the marginal status of any other verse of scripture. Most Bible-believing scholars, including Don Carson and Dan Wallace, believe that the narrative of the woman taken in adultery was not originally in the text. Carson writes, those manuscripts that do include it display a rather high frequency of textual variance. The diversity of placement confirms the inauthenticity of the verses. The command that women be silent in church, in addition to sharing these features, 
is also like the narrative of the, of the adulteress, since it contains word usage uh, typical of the book's author. It disrupts the narrative or topic of the passage and has marginal symbols or notes indicating scribal awareness of a textual problem. In both cases, the most important New Testament manuscript, Codex Vaticanus, has a symbol of a textual variant at the exact point the passage begins. Furthermore, the passage, Silenced Women, has many more evidences that it was added later than even the narrative of the adulteress. It makes alien use of vocabulary from this chapter. It conflicts with the goal of instruction in the church. Just as the law says, does not fit Paul's theology or style, nor is there any such law in the Old Testament. It subordinates a weak social group that Paul champions. Its vocabulary mimics that of the later 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15. In 1 Corinthians, only these verses are directed to people in the churches. The whole rest of the letter is directed to the church of Corinth. And it fits an obvious motive for this addition to silence women, which was the popular wisdom of the day. The conflicts between the content of these verses and Paul's teachings indicate that if Paul put them in the margin, he probably did so to identify what false prophecy he had in mind in his adjacent rebuke of one who thinks he's a prophet. Most scholars who published an analysis of the manuscript data, however, like Gordon Fee, have concluded that these verses were not in Paul's original letter or the margin of the original letter. My book, Man and Woman, One in Christ, Out in the Hall, identifies these seven evidences from actual manuscripts plus nine internal features of the text that support understanding this passage as a later edition. Tonight, I have only enough time to highlight the evidence from one of these manuscripts, Codex Vaticanus. It is the oldest Greek Bible written before AD 350. It uses the symbol shown on screen, two dots followed by a long bar, eight times. Each of the eight occurs at the exact location of a widely recognized multi-word edition, not in the original text. It is similar to the symbols Origen used in his critical edition of the Greek Old Testament, since it combines two dots and a long bar to mark every passage where it added text, not in the Hebrew scriptures. Seven of these eight symbols in Codex Vaticanus occur by a line containing a large cap at the exact point where some manuscripts add text. The red triangles on screen identify where the following words were added. Jesus said to them, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost, inserted from Luke 19.10 into Matthew 18.11. But Jesus, with an article, Blessed are you among women, inserted from Luke 142 into Luke 128. In the church, in those days, Acts 6.10 is the only case where instead of one large gap, there are two small gaps, probably because the, the added text has two parts, the addition of the holy after spirit, and because it was to convict them concerning them with all boldness, since they were not able to face the truth directly. In two of the eight, the gap is at the end of a line. In these, the bar marks the interface between the original text and the later edition. 
it underscores the last line of text before the insertion. Luke 14.24 ends with a five-letter gap marking the end of text after which other manuscripts insert text exactly as found in Matthew 22.14. For many are called, but few are chosen, which perfectly introduces the following parable of the great banquet. Similarly, this symbol preceding 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 5 underscores the last line of text before the text beginning, let women be silent in the churches. Since these verses are the only multi-word later edition ever proposed here, and since there is so much evidence for the later edition, they are the obvious reference for the symbol. This symbol indicates that these verses are a later edition, not in the original text, and hence without apostolic authority. To summarize, the only natural explanation of the manuscript evidence, the first Corinthians 14, 34 to 35 was originally, is that it was originally written in the margin of a manuscript. We can only conjecture who wrote it in the margin, why, and when. If it's a later edition, not in the original text, as the Vatican symbol indicates, it does not have apostolic authority. If it quotes a false prophecy, that false prophecy does not have authority. Therefore, whether it was added later or Paul had his original secretary put it in the margin to identify the false prophecy, he hints that in verse 37, this command that women be silent in the church should not be used to establish theology or church practice. Reason 12, men and women have separate roles in church. Scripture nowhere clearly excludes women from leadership roles over men in the church. In fact, Paul explicitly expresses the equal standing of male and female in Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 11 states, however, neither is woman separate from man, nor is man separate from woman in the Lord. Standard Greek dictionaries do not support the translation independent. Paul states that man and woman are not separate in the context of affirming that women, like men, may pray and prophesy, leading worship in church. Therefore, Paul's denial that women are separate from men in the Lord must apply to women in church leadership. Paul introduces this verse with the word plain, however, which in Greek highlights his point of central concern. Therefore, Paul is stating a fundamental principle of public worship. There is no gender-based separation in church leadership. Galatians 2 to 3 also explicitly affirms this fundamental principle. When Peter withdrew from table fellowship with Gentiles in Galatia, Paul opposed him to his face because he stood condemned of hypocrisy and acting contrary to the gospel. In defending his denunciation of Peter's unequal treatment, Paul asserts the principle of the equal standing of Jew and Gentile in Christ and expands it to include slave and free and male and female in Galatians 3.28. Therefore, this verse in context teaches that any exclusion of Gentiles, slaves, or women as a class from full participation in church is contrary to the gospel. If I had time, I would identify 42 theological 
historical, cultural, contextual, and exegetical reasons why Galatians 3.28 should not be limited to who can be saved but must have practical implications in church life. And the article is available up on the table. This verse is a call to a radically new social interaction based on equality in the body of Christ, the church. Without any hint that there, they are exceptions, it states that in Christ there is no male-female division. It is not excluding women from leadership roles in the church. Is, is it not in excluding women from leadership roles in the church that one is doing precisely such a male-female division? Peter clearly repented of his hypocrisy and action contrary to the gospel because he praises all Paul's letters, which always include Galatians, as scripture. 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16. Those who say they affirm the equality of men and women, yet restrict the roles women that may hold in church leadership, should seriously consider Peter's example and make it a matter of prayer whether God in Scripture and by His Holy Spirit is calling them too to repent and acknowledge with Paul that such a male-female division in the church is contrary to the gospel. Let's recap what the Bible really teaches on these 12 reasons. Number one, men and women should share leadership. Leadership is not exclusively male. Two, men and women should submit to one another in the church, and in marriage. Number three, women may teach in church. Number four, men and women share dominion over creation. Number five, woman is a strength corresponding to man, not his subordinate. Number six, male rule is the result of the fall. Seven, the Old Testament approves women in leadership. Eight, the biblical ideal is that all believers should be priests and should prophesy. Nine, there were women leaders in the apostolic church. Ten, the Bible does not exclude women from local church offices. In fact, the only person the Bible explicitly names with the title of the local church office is a woman. 11. The Bible encourages women to speak, even prophesy in church. And 12. The Bible teaches that the exclusion of women from leadership roles is contrary to the gospel. A close examination of these 12 alleged biblical reasons for complementarianism reveals that the Bible teaches quite the contrary. The equal standing of man and woman in creation and in the new creation in Christ. The problem with these 12 biblical reasons for complementarianism is not just that none of the texts to which they appeal clearly teaches that women should not exercise authority over men in the church. Their crucial problem is that so many fundamental principles of the gospel of the Bible directly oppose such an exclusion of women, including each of the following theological axioms from Paul that man and women are equally created in God's image, given dominion over the earth, given the creation blessing, given the creation mandate, and are equally in Christ. Each of the following theological axioms from Paul also entails the equality of men and women, mutual submission in the church, mutual submission in marriage, 
the oneness of Christ's body, the priesthood of all believers, liberty in Christ, the new creation, and inaugurated eschatology. The Spirit gifts all for ministry. The nature of church leadership as service applies equally to men and women. There is no male-female division in Christ. And male and female are not separate in the Lord. In spite of all this, some say that the Bible excludes all women, even women God has called and gifted for ministry, from teaching or having authority over men in the church. This causes untold loss to the church and pain to those excluded. It also leads many to despise God's word as an oppressor of women. Most of all, it must grieve our Lord who called and gifted them for ministry. The Bible records many women, as well as men, leading the church. It teaches their shared authority and calls men and women to mutual submission in the church and marriage. The texts teaching these things are numerous and unambiguous. I set out 39 years ago to prove that the Bible limits the ministry of women. My study of the text of the Bible itself forced me to abandon the complementarian idea that women <coughs> must not teach or have authority over men in the church. I am now firmly convinced the Bible nowhere clearly teaches this, but clearly affirms instead the equal standard of man and woman in church and in marriage. Thank you very much for your kind attention. We've just heard very explicit, very careful, very accurate um, interpretations and descriptions of biblical texts. And it's very hard to believe how so many of the texts could have been inverted to a different opinion and use. Would you like to speak about who benefits from this misuse of texts? Who benefits from the misuse of texts? Well, I can tell you in one case. When I got married, uh, I'd already been convinced that Women can do anything in the church, according to the New Testament. But I was getting married, and I grew up in a home where my dad was the head of the family. And when we had family council, uh, and the five children and mom voted, it seemed like dad had seven votes. <laughs> uh, and that was kind of, it worked pretty well. Dad was a great dad. And I kind of like that kind of arrangement because I, like most of us, is a, I'm a pretty selfish guy. I like to have a final say. And so when we got married, I urged my wife in her vows to agree to obey me. Well, it was after that that I studied what the Septuagint text does with this word head. And I realized I was imposing on scripture my English understanding of the word head, not an original first century Greek sense at all. And I began to look at what Paul does using Adventist explaining, and I realized he's not talking about leader at all in this passage. And the context is mutual submission. We know that there's no verb for women submit to your husbands. The verb submit comes from the previous phrase of the same sentence, submitting one to another in the fear of Christ. Wives to your husbands. We know it because every manuscript before 350 AD 
has the verb only in verse 21. And every manuscript after 350 AD has the verb in verse 22, it's stuck in. And we know why they did it. It's because in the lectionary cycle, they wanted something to say about marriage. So they started marriage by saying, why submit your husbands? And it's true that as part of mutual submission, wives are to submit to their husbands. But husbands are also to submit to their wives. That's what, that's what mutual means. The reciprocal program is reciprocal because it goes both ways. When I was in uh, Uganda in July of this year, talking about this topic, one of the students in the Anglican Seminary raised his hand and said, here in Uganda, we have a custom that the wife bows at the feet of her husband. Is that okay? I scratched my head and said, well, I guess so, as long as the husband also bows at the feet of his wife. And they roared with laughter. <laughs> they, uh, this is such a new concept that is a mutual submission. In this case, I was the beneficiary of the bad exegesis. And I wanted it to go that way. But as I studied scripture, I realized I cannot honestly push that. It doesn't fit scripture. Now, women are to submit to their husbands, but it's mutual. Husbands too. Any other questions? Example of Christ. He does not mean 
that the husband is the savior of the world. He does not mean that the husband is a member of the Trinity. He does not mean all kinds of things. What he specifies is nurture your wife. That's the point. Follow Christ's example. Remember, Christ washed the feet. I mean, how much more putting yourself at the disposal of others can you get to washing your feet? As a model for them. He says, your model for leadership should not be like the world trying to domineer over others. It's to be a servant of others. Another question? Um, if this is more or less what uh, the first century church, how they would have understood the text, how did we sort of get to complementarianism being, uh, as, in my experience, the more accepted <coughs> Very good question. I wish I could give you an hour lecture that they gave in Kenya uh, on the attitude of the early church fathers toward men and women. Because it is amazing. You have people like Chrysostom saying, Look at the New Testament. Look at Junia, out, this woman, outstanding among the apostles. And he refers to all these other women in Romans 16 and says, the women of the New Testament days were lions. And he says, uh, the women put us men to shame. No, no, we ought to be proud that we have such women in our churches, in our church history. But then he goes on to say that, but we men will overtake them. <laughs> and he doesn't, he said, he, you see, he could read Greek really well. He knew what the New Testament taught. He didn't try to make, he, he knew what it said. But he was also part of his culture. He believed in uh, patriarchy, and he liked that system. Men like the power. And so even though he said the New Testament teaches women can do these things, the New Testament women did these things, nevertheless, we will live as we feel like we can live. And it's amazing to, to read these comments. And you realize in the entire first millennium of the church, there's not a single credible witness that denies that Junia was outstanding among the apostles. Not one. So, the, the weird thing, and by the way, you've heard my talk today, most of what I said today, the same comments about the text were made by the early church fathers. And I could give them quotations, one after another. They understood the Greek, like I'm explaining it. How do we know? The, the, the apostolic fathers knew biblical Greek and understood it much better than we can. We have to struggle to understand it. The, in the power of the Holy Spirit working in the early community where the Spirit gifted men and women to prophesy and they reached out. Why do you suppose Paul was take, persecuting not just the men but the women too? Because they were leading the spiritual revolution with the men. And so he wanted to put them in prison and kill them just like the men. And where we see movements around the world, across history, which are alive with the power of God's Spirit, you see women active and alive. People have asked me, you're a missionary in Japan, why is the church in Japan so small? And why is the church in Korea so strong? There are three reasons I believe are true. This is based on conversations with Mrs. Moffat. Her husband and she were missionaries in Korea at that critical time. Three things. First of all, in Korea, the Bible women were ubiquitous. They gave women the power to go out and to teach and to uh, lead in the church. In Japan, they did somewhat, but not as much. The second reason is that the Presbyterian Church 
was facing a crisis. The liberal uh, and fundamentalist controversy. controversy. And you had uh, a group of people who were standing for the Bible, and a group of people who were saying, no, we're not bound by the Bible. And they decided that they would send to Korea those narrow fundamentalists and the ones who were open to working with the more liberal, they go to Japan. So that's the second one. The third is, in Korea, there is a traditional belief in the creator God. In Japan, there isn't. And so there was the cultural background for understanding. When we were in Japan, when you try to con convey the gospel, it was really hard because they had no concept of God like we think of God. No concept of sin like we think of sin. And many people said, I've been converted many times as they one by one learned more and accepted more. Uh, and I remember there was one time I said, this Bible study group said, Phil, you've got to come speak to our group and give the gospel because there's, there's a girl in our group and I think she's getting really open. So I went and uh, the, the, the message was about uh, Abraham going up on Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac. And uh, her response was, now I understand it. But the more I understood what she understood, it was not at all the biblical message. <laughs> and so even when you try to make things really simple, four spiritual laws type of simple, uh, it's hard. One of the key reasons was freeing women to minister. First of all, thank you so much for coming. I'm very, very happy that you came. And uh, thank you for your courage and your perseverance in doing this. Um, there was one question I had, um, particularly because in a lot of conversations, what I understand complementarians tend to bring in to the passage in Timothy is how Paul appeals to creation. Um, and, and I think uh, that's actually what Dr. Carson talks about. And um, it, it's, it's hard to argue that. So from what I understood here, you're saying the creation account doesn't say that. Does that mean we're supposed to think Paul is wrong if there, I'm assuming there's some other um, way of dealing with that. Does that's that make sense? That's, that's an excellent sense? question. I'm glad you asked it. Uh, after verse 12 in 1 Timothy, you have two more verses. Verse 13, for man was created first, then woman, and the woman, the man was not deceived, but the woman, being thoroughly deceived, fell into transgression. Those two reasons explain why Paul is restricting women from assuming authority to teach men in the church. In the culture, for a woman to assume that authority to herself without being granted it caused waves. This was countercultural, and it caused problems. Uh, it was aggressive for a woman to seize that authority. It's aggressive for a man to seize authority without permission, but it's even more aggressive for a woman. The parallel in 1 Corinthians 11 is the key, and Carson acknowledges this parallel. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is talking about respect for one source. <laughs> And you, we could spend the next two hours talking about First Corinthians 11. But let me make it really simple, and then you can, you can look at this later. Uh, there's the articles published in Priscilla Papers. You can look it up. Again and again in First Corinthians 11, Paul speaks about what is disgraceful. It's disgraceful for a man to pray to prophesy heavy down from the end. It's disgraceful for a woman to pray uncovered. And people think that that's a garment over the head. When I was in Cambridge, we were visited by a professor of classics from a foreign university. And knowing he was one of the top men in the world, I said, how do you understand this? He said, Phil, come with me to the Cambridge Classics Library. It has the best collection of Hellenistic busts from 300 BC to 380 of men and women, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And we went through these from 300 years before Paul up to Paul's day and then 300 years after Paul. And 
very few had any carpet on the head. And these are public portrayals of women. You look at Billy's paintings, same thing. You look at Friese's, same thing. Uh, you look at terracotta work, same thing. All of the graphic pictures of women from that period rarely have a veil covering. Uh, you look at what Tertullian says about the Jews in Alexandria, Egypt. He says that the Jews wear a garment veil, not because it's the custom of the Hellenists, because they don't do this, but because it's a custom within the church. He's acknowledging this is not a Hellenistic custom. However, virtually every uh, bust of a woman from hundreds of years before Paul until hundreds of years after Paul had the hair done up. And the ones that had loose hair had hair hanging down loose. These were depictions of the maenads, the wild women of the dynasty cult who would engage in orgies after they would prophesy. They would let down their hair and prophesy and engage in orgies. Well, Paul addressed the letter of the Corinthians and says, look at all these sins which are contrary to being in Christ. And he mentions uh, the feminine and homosexuals in that list. And he says, and such were some of you. The other thing is, in the Dionysiac cult, even though this women would engage in orgies, Pausanias says more men were engaged in homosexual acts in the Dionysiac cult than women. And many of the images of the god Dionysus, who's the god of wine, shows him as female or half male, half female, uh, this sort of imagery. So what's happening here? Pausanias, by the way, said virtually the entire population of Achaia, the part of Greece that includes Corinth, was introduced into sexual life in the dynasty of Corinth. So here they, they grow up in this, many of them have probably got it initiated, like their contemporaries, in a sexual life in the Dionysia cult, where women would let their hair down as a symbol of their uh, sexual uh, freedom. And men would wear effeminate hair to attract homosexual liaisons. And he's saying, in the church, we don't want the leadership to model these things because of that undermines marriage. And for a woman to let her hair down is disrespectful to man because woman has her source. In it. You should respect your source. Woman came from the rib of Adam. You should respect him. For a woman to seize authority to teach men in the church without giving, being given permission, that's disrespectful. For a woman to let her hair down is disrespectful to her husband. She's saying, I'm available to anybody. It's because of disrespect that Paul uses the source argument. Woman came from man. And the same thing applies here. Women who are seizing authority in Ephesus were doing something disrespectful to man. The second reason is that Eve was thoroughly deceived. Well, why is Paul prohibiting women in Ephesus from teaching? Because they've been deceived. He begins by giving the one imperative of the command, let women learn. Well, he wants them to learn the truth of the Christian message. And they've got to learn to do that. And he was saying, just as in Eden, a deceived woman disobeyed God leading to the fall, so Eve's in Ephesus were deceived and leading to the fall of the church. And that's why he makes the prohibition. I am not in the current situation, I'm going as it is, permitting women to assume authority to each man. And people say, well, why did he only do that to women? Well, he did. He, in chapter one, he told the men who were teaching false teachings to cease. See, what is prohibited is not exercising authority over men. What is prohibited is the assumption of authority over men to teach. Now, Don Carson takes the passage differently. He says, 
oh, well, we have this order of creation. And you have the, the authority given to the man from the beginning, but you look at Genesis 1, where does it say the man has authority over the woman? Nowhere. You look at Genesis 2, where does it say the man has authority over the woman? Nowhere. He reads it into small details. It's not in the text. He then reads this power authority. When you look at 1 Corinthians 11, there's only one reference to authority. A woman ought to have authority over her own head. It's not the man's authority. It's the woman's authority. The idea that it's a symbol of somebody else's authority is contrary to every occurrence of exosthea in Greek literature. Ramsey debunked this long ago. Why do people keep quoting these things? I don't know. Yes, uh, it would be a contradiction. I mean, if you say that Genesis does not teach the order, but Paul does, but let's just read what Paul says. There's nothing in Paul's language about a hierarchy of gender order. It's just not there. What he's saying is that acting disrespectfully and shamefully, undermining the Christian message and Christian morality, that's what's wrong. And by letting the hair down, they were doing that. Excellent question. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, mine's, here we go. Uh, mine's uh, particularly with in the household. Um, in First Timothy 3, it talks about... Uh, 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 where was it at? Which book? First Timothy 3. Okay. An overseer needs to manage his own family well. Um, this kind of dumped in two, two passages, actually, in First uh, Peter as well. Um, how, if he's saying he must manage his family well, how is it that Paul is using the same type of language as far as uh, mutual submission within the family? Why use manage particularly his own family instead well, of... First of all, it doesn't say his own family. Okay. It's, it's one's own family, which could apply to either men or women. So if someone is in a church leadership position, that person needs to know how to lead. That's the point. Well, I, I, I guess the question is then, if it's to mutually submit with one another, are you saying then it, within the church it's mutual submission as well? Because if this particularly was within the, the marriage, that he's the, whether male or female is supposed to manage the home, like why use manage the home? Why not use mutually submit if that's his language okay. elsewhere? Okay. Great point. There's, if you compare 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 14, with 1 Timothy, you're seeing two very different models of Christian worship. In 1 Corinthians, you have a uh, everybody involved, open worship, anyone can speak out. That works great as long as God is working in the people and the people are living obediently and so forth. In Ephesians, you've got false teachers coming in. They're teaching bad stuff. And it's undermining the church. It was so bad that in chapter 5, Paul writes that some of the younger widows have already followed after Satan. That's strong language. And they were going about from house to house saying things they ought not. Well, they had house churches. They probably had gone from house church to house church undermining the church. Furthermore, they're called fluoroi. Gordon Fee says that this word never in Greek literature means gossips. It means foolish philosophy. They were propounding this foolish philosophy of the false teachers. In that situation, the open worship where anyone can say anything becomes a problem. When people start saying things that undermine the truth, what do you do? And so in this situation, Paul says, we need some barriers. We need some limits. We need some rational worship here. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to have certain people who have been recognized as leaders and you're to follow what they say. And they're to teach you 
and only people who are recognized as leaders should join the teaching. Now that's a different model of worship, but it's a response to practical development. Now we today, uh, in our various situations, can be in those same kinds of situations. Uh, sometimes you've got a house fellowship and everyone is sharing and it's, uh, it's great. And sometimes you get somebody in there who's just pushing the wrong thing. And what do you do? Well, then you need to start getting some order. And so Paul calls for order. So you have this change in, in the model. And if you look at the New Testament teaching, as the church has done for millennia, they find in it support for various different models for church organization. Local church, Episcopal, Catholic, hierarchies. And each one has its strengths and weaknesses. And each one can appeal to some part of the New Testament that seems to support that. I don't know that there's a perfect answer. But the Bible has given us a variety of images of the church and how it can be governed to help us in our own work. Thanks for your talk. Uh, just a quick, quick question on uh, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, uh, looking through some of the different... Uh, yeah, can you speak a little bit louder, Okay, just looking through a couple of different versions in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, describing uh, elders or overseers. And I, I thought you mentioned in the comment up there that the, that the pronoun he wasn't used. Just, I'm looking at these two versions, and it seems like repeatedly it says, he will do this, he will yes. do that. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to understand, is, is the translation just repeatedly wrong? Or because as someone who, you know, I, I care about the text like you do, but then when you see that over and over again, it just sort of reinforces the idea that with respect to elders in any event, it seems to be pointing to, the male pronoun, and if that's wrong, uh, if, if that's well, the wrong term. It is wrong in the sense that the Greek text does not have a single masculine pronoun. All of those are inserted. Um, and insofar as the goal of the translation is to reproduce and to help us understand the original Greek text, putting those pronouns in is making a judgment that goes contrary to the text. So I say it's wrong. Now, when you have, let, I was in, a, in a, a back and forth dialogue with a complementarian, and he said, all you need to do is read the Bible and you'll get the answer. But if your Bible says he, 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 him, him, and the subject is any man, but the Greek subject is anyone, I mean, they're going to think it's a man. If your text says Junius with an S on it, and you look up in your analytical Greek lexicon, and it says Junius, masculine singular, well, then, oh, he's a man. Well, there's absolutely no legitimate evidence for that. And yet, translations did it. We are influenced by our translations. And when the translations are wrong, we suffer. And it's because of that that we need people that come back to the text and say, this is not right. Now, in the case of the NIV, when they translated 1 Timothy 2.12 as, as have authority, I wrote them and I laid out all the evidence, every occurrence of that verb in Greek literature that survived. And I showed them, assume authority is the meaning throughout Paul's period. And as the dominant meaning, could mean dominant, more likely assume authority, 
They accepted the argument and they changed it. But I also wrote them and said, you have inserted 12 masculine pronouns in chapter 3, and that is not true to the Greek. You should change that. But they didn't change it. So, yes, they changed some things, but they didn't change them all. Part of the problem is the committees have to cover so much ground in so much time, and the publishers have agreed to pay the people on the committees per hour. And so they say, you've got to finish the entire New Testament in two months. Well, I mean, it's ridiculous. You can't do that. So part of the problem, though, is that the chairman of the committee was complementarian. And the committee was staffed with complementarians. And they didn't want to change it because they wanted the man to have the authority. Um, you know, it's hard to attribute motive because people, I make mistakes too. I recently made a big blunder. I thought, how could I do that? I'm human. Uh, I want you to give a little sense of the historical background. During Prohibition, many churches said that Paul's statement, handle not, touch not, taste not, is prohibiting drinking alcoholic beverages. There it is. Taste not. Uh, when you read the NIV translation, and it's clear, Paul is saying, these false teachers are saying, taste not. And they're wrong. Nevertheless, this was used throughout Prohibition as a defense. And so how the translation goes makes a huge difference in how people respond. And slavery, during, before and during the Civil War, there were many theologians, in, not just in the South, in the North as well, who argued that the Bible teaches slavery. Slaves, obey your masters. Therefore, we should not try to overcome slavery. It's God's will. And some people said, children of Ham, that's what they get. Um, now, you read the Bible today, and nobody says the Bible teaches slavery. But back then, they did. And there were vested interests for that. The Westminster Catechism says that not all scriptures are clear, but they're sufficiently clear for us to understand salvation. But even on the question of salvation, Martin Luther, in his introduction to Galatians, said that one day he realized that dekaiao, justification to be justified, is in the passive. And it's not righteousness that you've achieved for yourself. It's, it's something that God has given to you. And he says, I felt like I was freed from prison and my spirit soared to heaven because he studied the text and saw it was a grammatical passive. And he realized the consequences. So even something as simple as salvation by faith depends on the text being made available in a way we can understand it. The Catholic Church at that time prohibited the publication of scripture in the vernacular. So people didn't, didn't have easy access. Now there were, there were 17 German Bibles before the time of Martin Luther. So there were more German Bibles in German. There were German Bibles and people had some access, but it was Martin Luther's.